Our second speaker in this first session is Smita Krishnaswamy excuse me, from Yale. And Smita, if you can share your screen, we can get going now, I think. Okay, sure. Okay, can you see my screen? All good. Uh, let me try to advance it. Okay, advancing? Yep, all good. <laughs> All right, um, thank, thank you uh, to the organizers for inviting me and thank you to Peter for a great talk to set things up. Um, today I'll be talking about some of the data geometric and topological approaches that we've developed in my lab um, to address fairly generic questions in trying to understand structure and patterns in biomedical data. Um, a lot of the techniques I've talked about are um, applicable to several different data types, but um, I'll be focusing quite a bit on single cell data, which has uh, high throughput in the sense that we have lots and lots of observations as well as high, pretty high dimensionality, uh, whether it be proteins, dozens of dimensions to RNA-seq, thousands of dimensions, and newer approaches like single cell ataxic. Um, so from all of these kinds of data, there is a lot more data that's generated than really there are, um, you know, biological experts or people who can look at it. But even if you can look at it, it can be very difficult to interpret this data. So some of the general questions that we've sought to answer are how to denoise the data, separate sort of the signal from the noise, how to distill its structure so that you can understand uh, what's going on in the data and perhaps follow up some of these processes uh, with hypotheses or further experimentation. Um, lately, we have the advent of multiple samples of such kinds of data. So it's not just one data set, but massively parallel cohort of such data. And you can imagine data collected on patients or under perturbation conditions that are massively conducted in parallel. And it's how to integrate and understand these. Um, and finally, um, as most of you know, a lot of these advanced measurement types uh, are static in the sense that they destroy the cell or they don't follow entities in time and how do we derive dynamics from the static snapshots. So um, a lot of these challenges what sort of what they have in common is I feel like I'm getting messages in the chat. Um, is it? Um, no, it's not correct. It's not. It's fine. Just keep going speed up, please. <laughs> um, it is that there is latent structure in the data and even though the ambient space in which the data is measured is high dimensional that the lay data could lie in a lower dimensional uh, space that you can model as a low dimensional manifold um, really understanding the structure and the shape of this uh, really helps us address all of these challenges and in order to do that a uh, trick that we often use is we turn to data graphs so you have data that's here in two dimensions and you can define a graph on this data by way of distances it, they can be euclidean distances you can then convert the distances to affinities uh, using any kind of kernel function like this such that only local relationships are preserved and a further augmentation to that that we find very helpful is redefining these connectivities by using um, diffusion on this graph and computing diffusion probabilities as long-range denoised connectivities and so in particular the diffusion operator uh, which was pioneered by uh, Rafi Koifman about 15 years ago um, is very good at weeding through the noise of the data and this would potentially be the first eigenvector of the diffusion operator. And we've used these for further analyses. More recently, uh, we've also come into ideas of data topology. So the diffusion uh, geometry, depending on sort of um, the construction of the graph, gives you one level of structure in the data, whereas we're usually interested in exploring multiple levels of organizations or groupings, especially when it comes to trying to predict disease outcome or other emergent properties. And for this, we, we turn to topology as it's applied to data science, which basically involves sweeping through the resolutions of the data to see what different shapes you know, uh, arise and die. And um, finally, as a tool, we often use deep learning, uh, since autoencoders, for example, are efficient ways of learning lower dimensional 
embeddings of higher dimensional data. Um, so I'll first start with how we utilize data geometry to understand the structure of the data. Um, you might have, some of you might have heard, heard, heard me talk about this method before, uh, but uh, the method, this method and sort of the underlying um, developments in it have led us uh, quite far in this kind of search for the structure. And so the idea of fate is that we wanted to find a lower dimensional embedding where we can tell how, what the structure of the data is. Um, and that doesn't necessarily disentangle the data into separate clusters or dimensions, but rather keeps the global structure together so that we can tell how branches or clusters relate to each other. Um, the issue was that some of the other dimensionality reduction methods that people were using to interpret the data uh, often miss uh, details such as this branching structure, uh, often cannot denoise in nonlinear directions. So, and often shatter the data because of what they actually preserve. So this is this data set of this artificial tree sampled, rotated into high dimensions and embedded with these techniques. And you see what the resultant structure is. And we feel like if we deliver something that's faithful to the structure, you can, for example, decide that there are trajectories and how to analyze them further. Um, and the way FATE does this very much uses the basics of the diffusion geometry I spoke about. You go from data to distances to affinities, and then you Markov normalize these affinities and raise it to a power t to get diffusion probabilities. From this point onwards, uh, fate operates differently than diffusion maps. Um, actually, before too, we use a different kernel for fate um, that is sharper. It's called the alpha de decay kernel. Um, so from this point onwards, what fate does is it um, uses these diffusion probability and, and the diffusion probability distribution associated with each data point as the new features for the data points, and it computes a divergence between them. We compute a symmetric M divergence between these data points, and uh, the effect that has is that it makes faraway data points contextualize every point as much as any near neighbor, uh, or close to as much as any as any near neighbor. And then we embed this in two dimensions with MDS to squeeze these new distances, which we call potential distances, in two dimensions for visualization. So just to give you a little bit more intuition, this is the distance matrix of the Swiss roll. Uh, you see that this uh, distance matrix doesn't sort of follow the manifold structure. There's connections that cut across the manifold, whereas the intrinsic space of the data could be like this. So cellular development might be in this intrinsic space. Uh, when you convert it to affinities, these sidebands sort of weaken, but they still exist. And this is where the Markov diffusion operator really helps. As you raise it to the power of uh, T, these spurious connections disappear and you get uh, something that's very focused on sort of the density of the data and following the data manifold. And then after we obtain that, we convert to potential distances. So we've shown this on a number of systems, including a developmental system where you take human embryonic stem cells and we tried to differentiate them over a 27 day time course. And then we overlaid the time snapshots on top of it. And what you see here is that uh, fate is able to um, show you the different lineage trajectories and where they branch much more clearly than some of the other methods like PCA, which gives you a blurry embedding and TSNE, which feels free to shatter data and UMAP, which is pretty much very similar to TSNE, uh, as well as diffusion maps, which while they contain all the information, disentangle the trajectories into different dimensions. We've also shown it on data with primarily cluster structure, uh, where we can see um, sm smaller progressions within clusters, for example, in this retinal bipolar data set. So um, fate has been useful in giving us a particular granularity of the structure of the data, but coming back to how we would get multi-level organization, for this, uh, we turned to data topology. So topology is a pure math subject that involves characterizing the abstract shapes of objects. For example, in terms of the dimensionality of the holes that are contained within, within them. So uh, these are quantified often using these, <clears throat> sorry, Betty numbers. And these Betty numbers um, count, for example, the number of connected components, holes, voids, and so forth. Um, 
And when it's used computationally, there's a concept called computational homology that harks back to the data geometry. So these points are thought to have distances between each other, and there's a sweep of an epsilon parameter that creates a radius around each point. And as you grow this radius, different components are born and die, and that's basically recorded on this persistence diagram that you see on the right. And um, here, for example, you see a, uh, a cycle emerged. And when a cycle emerges, you get a, a two-dimensional or a Betty number, or sorry, the Betty one number arising. Whenever a component was destroyed, several components started in the beginning, and we record whenever they're destroyed. Um, so most all the points here will be uh, in this half of the graph. And so uh, we like that idea, but as you saw, we don't quite trust the ambient space of the data, but we trust more the diffusion geometric intrinsic space. So we sought to develop a diffusion-based topology that similarly sweeps through the granularities of data. And here you see a sweeping of the granularity to reveal different structure. Um, in order to do this, we actually use the same diffusion operator. Uh, we power it and we reapply it to the data. And what this creates is a low pass filter that causes the data to kind of condense in on itself. Um, and so we often call this diffusion condensation. We run these iterations over and over again. And as we run, run these iterations over and over again, uh, points come close to their diffusion neighbors to eventually reveal all different levels of granularity. Um, we note that this is different than hierarchical clustering, for example, where uh, points don't naturally come together, but are rather forced together at every iteration. Uh, you can see here that there are some iterations where there's no merges. So what that does is it actually gives you a sort of hierarchical tree where the branch lengths actually have um, meaning. And we've actually used the entire tree, for example, to organize all of the neurons uh, in the C. elegans worm and understand uh, how different circuits arise and what other neurons are related to these circuits, because we have sort of a picture of the whole circuit. And this was published last month in Nature, together with the Daniel Colon Ramos lab. Um, so in order to show how I utilize this for single cell data, particularly in terms of disease, uh, we have one more tool from our lab that I'm going to talk about uh, fairly quickly, and that's this tool called MELD. Um, and in MELD, we start to try to understand how two different single cell conditions are different from one another. So what we do is we create a joint data graph. And in this joint data graph, uh, we create discrete signals that correspond to the control condition uh, and the experimental condition. So this is sort of a toy setup where there's two conditions, but you could do it for more. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to get a density estimate over the graph of the control condition and the experimental. And in particular, we're trying to get an idea of where they're different and where there would be enrichment in one condition over the other. Note that the sort of other way or earlier way of doing this is to chop the data into arbitrary clusters that may not have anything to do with the resolution of the experimental response or the comparison you're doing, healthy versus disease, and look at fold change abundance. But rather, we invert this order. We, we define a continuous signal that goes over cells, and we use this signal to cluster so that we get clusters that are sort of at the correct resolution, which is a lot of uh, what we're trying to do with the topology, is trying to get things at the right, right resolution. So how do we density estimate uh, on the graph? For this, in the MELD paper, we show that we can port a heat diffusion-based density estimation developed by Bota et al. onto the graph. So um, all we have to do is we define these discrete um, labels on the graph. So these are like Dirac signals. And same with the control indicator and the experimental indicator. And uh, we actually use a filter based on uh, heat diffusion to give us a density estimate on the graph. Um, and what this filter does is it smooths out high frequency noise in the signal and it gives you something very akin to a kernel density estimate. So then we use a Bayes formula to invert this into a likelihood and this gives you a likelihood about whether the cell is likely to occur in the experimental condition or the control condition, but it gives you a score for each and every cell. So we're not, um, again, we're going back to a single cell resolution to get this. 
And so when we applied it to, for example, T cell stimulation, you get all your uh, experimental labels. These are discrete labels. And after doing the MEL density estimation and uh, likelihood estimation, we get this. And we can see which areas of the manifold are enriched for which condition. Um, so when we cluster on top of this, we notice that we get signatures that are a little bit sharper and um, more revealing of the gene activity that's uh, causing these. So it can be more useful for gaining mechanistic insight. So we combine these ingredients, fate, diffusion topology, and meld uh, in a newer project called multi-scale fate. In multi-scale fate, we're trying to um, not only look at data at one level of granularity, but actually interactively and visually look at the data at multiple levels of granularity. So for example, here you have the same PBMC data set. If you zoomed in here, you would see additional structure and granularity. And one of the issues that this solves in high dimensional data visualization is this problem of crowding. When you have crowding or the majority of structure at um, some resolution, you might see a very blurry structure here, which won't be revealed until you zoom in. Um, and another advantage is that this is highly scalable. And we were able to use this scalability in order to uh, look at 80 million cells from over 200 patients uh, who were admitted to Yale New Haven Hospital uh, with COVID. And um, these patients had several panels measured um, with flow cytometry, so PBMCs, B cells, T cells, uh, including cytokines and surface markers. And this was all part of the uh, Yale COVID impact project. And the, the um, experiments were um, given to us by Kiko Iwasaki and her postdoc, Patrick Wong. And here's an example of how uh, multi-scale fate is used here. Um, so first, at a large stretch, you can see that this is um, a multi-scale fate map of the T cell panel. Here, you can see that certain kinds of T cells are enriched for mortality. But when you zoom in, you get quite a mixed picture. Uh, you see that very specific T cell subtypes like IL-17+, interferon gamma+, plus, and granzyme B plus cells uh, are uh, highly likely to be occurring in patients who had uh, bad outcomes. Um, for example, they passed away or were sent to ho uh, hospice. And there's some other kinds of cells that are more enriched in patients who have good outcome, like this IL-16 plus. So uh, when T cells are looked at all as one group uh, of cells, they tend to be protective in the sense that uh, higher T cells are associated with better outcome, but when you zoom in, you can actually get the opposite, that there are some cell subtypes that are indicative of mortality. And we can actually um, compute which cell subtypes um, are associated with mortality uh, using an information theoretic type measure on the patients versus um, their mortality scores. So finally, um, and I'm not going to go into this, one of the cool things about this is uh, this kind of method where you can pick out populations at many different levels and granularities can allow you to featureize patients. So what are patients in this data set? Patients are these clouds of data. Each patient has thousands upon thousands of cells. They're not easy to fit, in, fit into a classifier. Uh, they're not the same size. They don't have the same number of uh, features, but now we can featureize the patients. Um, for example, here, as the, as the proportions of the cell types that we have at several different granularities, they're predictive, um, but we could also do it uh, via earth movers distance, which is a multi-scale density difference between multi-scale density estimates of patients. And now we can embed patients also with fate, like we embedded cells. Now here, each dot is a patient, and you see quite a nice structure with the patients. And now you can associate the different cellular populations with the patient outcome, which is following this first eigenvector trajectory. Um, here, um, it shows what I said about the T cells. The more T cells you have, the less likely you are to die. Uh, this has a high mutual information, but specific subtypes we showed can have the opposite trend. We see the same thing in the PBMC panel with CD14 minus CD16 plus monocytes having a positive association 
as well as CD16 high neutrophils having a positive association. And there's many other ways you could mine this data. And in fact, we can use these um, features to train a neural network classifier that classifies uh, with, with high accuracy. And this, this method is um, now under, under review in Nature Biotechnology. And the final thing that I wanted to uh, touch upon is uh, newer and excite, more exciting trend in our lab, which is to analyze dynamics. So just now I showed you static data analysis from patients who are dynamic entities. And actually several of these patients are having their cells measured um, on a weekly basis. So they could have their cells measured at week zero, week one, two, so on. But uh, there could be, uh, in the case of measuring populations, you might not be following the same patients. Patients are going in and out of the hospital. In the cellular context, you've destroyed all these cells, so you're not following specific entities in time. Um, and so our goal here is to be able to predict the population at time points when we didn't measure as well as map the trajectory of an individual entity on the basis of population level measurements. So there have been previous attempts at doing this. There's uh, RNA velocity. Um, so I think Peter uh, was a key player in developing this pretty cool method. This method actually gives you a local velocity arrow. You can see that local velocity arrows can be useful within a connected manifold. But if you have large spaces between when you're measuring cellular subtypes, you sort of lose the meaning of the velocity or the arrow. And of course, there's no arrows where, they, where you didn't measure any cells. Um, optimal transport, which we're finding very useful in many circumstances, have also been used. But if you do uh, plain optimal transport, you get this sort of piecewise linear approximation to the flow. So what we want instead is a natural and continuous interpolation. For this, uh, we turn to neural ODEs. You can think of neural ODEs as infinite depth neural networks. And this comes in analogy to residual neural networks, which can be interpreted as Euler integrators. Um, oh, the ODE network, um, in fact, uses a more advanced ODE solver that can sample you know, whenever it needs to sample more, for example, at points of more curvature. Uh, we used a neural ODE uh, together with a normalizing flow framework. Normalizing flows are ways of flowing one distribution to another using reversible operations. And usually what you do is you start with a distribution you can sample from and you flow it to a more complex distribution, but it, because it's reversible, um, you can learn to flow it back and, back and forth. Um, and usually you can calculate uh, the probability of the next distribution based on the first one using the change of variables formula. And the change of variables formula is sort of like a volume normalization uh, for the volume of this versus that, which is, leads to the normality conditions. So um, deep normalizing flows had been um, proposed in the last few years that use many, many layers, sort of like a ResNet. But of course, using the ODE net, you can go into a continuous normalizing flow. And the continuous normalizing flow uses the instantaneous change of variables formula. And this does create continuous paths, but we didn't feel that these paths were very realistic or they could, they're, they're basically very under constrained. In order to constrain these and obtain more realistic paths, we added a regularization on the L2 norm of the magnitude of the derivative that the ODE network learns. Um, so when you add a normalization on the ODE framework like this, and you limit um, the path directions, or you're constraining the path directions to be as efficient as possible, what we were able to show in this paper is that you're actually performing dynamic optimal transport, but it's dynamic optimal transport in the neural network sense, where we don't have hard constraints, but we're penalizing from deviations. Uh, so the distribution is penalized to start here, to end here, and go in as an efficient path as possible. And so here we show how this works, source, target, and here's uh, dynamic optimal transport, which is very computationally inefficient, but we computed it on this. Continuous normalizing flows have this wasteful slidey movement. Uh, and continuous normalizing flows with our regularization goes in straighter paths. Um, and this gave 
us a basis to work with where we were getting efficient paths, but we discovered that neural networks are flexible enough so that you can add additional regularizations on them. One of them is again a manifold regularization. We want the flow to follow the cellular manifold. For that, we just add a density penalty that says that paths have to go through as much density as they can. Uh, where available, they can also be penalized to follow RNA velocity. Um, so we can just penalize between an RNA velocity angle and this. So these are some of the regularizations we added in order to get realistic flows. So for example, let's say we had a flow that goes like this. The base ODE model with the optimal transport regularization sort of goes like this. With the density regularization, it's following the density much more. The velocity regularization also uh, clarifies things so that we get fairly realistic paths. And we've shown this on several uh, data sets where we had uh, discrete measurements that you can infer continuous trajectories. And what this can give us is continuous trends of what's happening to the genes and with the idea that you could use dynamics modeling to learn causality eventually, which we are still starting on. Um, so we're actually presently trying to do this on those K Yale COVID patients that I told you about. Some of those uh, patients have cells that were indeed measured at several week weeks apart. They're of course not the same cell because all the cells died. Um, and we're trying to see what happens to the gene trends and where exactly they start diverging between patients who do well uh, who have a good outcome versus patients who have an adverse outcome. And uh, we're still studying the, these trends. Um, so these and several of the other methods uh, that come out of our lab of this flavor are uh, released on our GitHub. They're also usually described on our website when we manage to update it. And finally, I just wanted to give a shout out to an open problems and single cell effort that uh, some of you have been involved with. I heard Peter talk about the lack of benchmarks in the field, lots of ground truth, and we're hopefully as a community trying to fix that. So if you're interested in contributing tasks, methods, or metrics uh, for this so that you know more mathematicians and computational people can get involved in this field, please visit this website. Thank you. Thank you very much, Smita. Great talk. So um, I see there are a couple of questions. Maybe the, I'll begin. I, I really, I saw I, my original question was going to be, can you incorporate real time information into fate and how would you do it? But you sort of began to answer that towards the end. Um, so the other question then related to that latter work is, how do you avoid over smoothing trajectories? If you remove intermediate time points, can you see sometimes that you end up getting trajectories that are erroneous? How dense does the time point sampling have to be for you to have confidence that this method is going to work? Because I guess that's still a challenge in the work that you presented at the end. Yeah, so I mean, when we have, uh, when we've had four or five time point data, it really depends on the system and how fast it's moving. Um, for example, the embryoid body data, we were easily able to remove any of the five time points and, and re-impute it. And that's actually the metric we show to show that the optimal transport is working. Um, so you'll, you'll obviously get a simplified trajectory if you have fewer time points. If you have two time points, you'll probably get something that's as straight as possible. Three will give you more curvature and things like that. It really depends on the dynamics that are in, in your system. But within, within those dynamics, you do get continuous paths that both fit and are efficient so that you can interpolate in intermediate time points. Okay, so um, questions from the audience. So first, Mauro Marie. So in diffusion geometry, how does the neighborhood criterion affect the outcome? The, so in diffusion uh, geometry, um, you define a kernel and the bandwidth of that kernel defines the connectivity. Um, so the outcome is dependent on how you define it. Often what we do is we define an adaptive bandwidth based on the kth nearest neighbor of the graph. But um, this is very different than using k nearest neighbors uh, alone without the diffusion, for example, as is done as in TSNI or UMAP. The reason is because diffusion still globally connects. So if you have k nearest neighbors and you walk three steps, you can go to the neighbors of the neighbors of the neighbor with some probability. Um, but what it really does, it, it gives the kernel anisotropy, 
entropy, uh, which makes it less sensitive to density differences in how you compute the manifold. So those are some of the specifics of how we compute the kernel. So we compute an adaptive kernel uh, adapted to, by using the bandwidth. Cool. Excellent. So then a question from Avi Srivastava. So um, they say, Smita, great talk. Um, they're curious if you've tried RNA velocity on multiple time points together. So I guess combining all the data at once and then seeing how it compares to the ODE methods that you talked about towards the end. So as I mentioned, RNA velocity is like giving a velocity vector. It gives you sort of an instantaneous change vector. It doesn't really give you the whole whole trajectory. And so uh, it, 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 we have compared um, and trajectory net performed vastly better on the test that it's meant to do, which is um, how to predict intermediate time points. But I think they're just giving different information. Yeah. And how does it? Sorry, I don't expect RNA velocity to be, you know, coming up with high dimensional ODE based dynamics. I'm really expecting it only to give a uh, velocity arrow, which is greatly useful. And what happens if you have a complex trajectory, Smita? So there's multiple different branch points and does, do, do things kind of begin to break down there uh, yeah. in that setting? So, so usually what you want is, and usually this is not a problem in single cell data, you can have things that branch. And in fact, we're studying branches in cancer cells that are just fine. Um, if you have points right on top of each other, this kind of deterministic ODE will, will not separate them. Um, so we, in those kinds of cases, if let's say we're dealing with a toy experiment like that, we just initially add noise and the noise is enough to, you know, give sensitive dynamics that diverge. Uh, but there's never a problem in cellular data because cells are never like identical measurements. I mean, see two cells have identical measurements. That'd be weird. Yes. Okay. So then there's a, and then well, there's a rather generic question about what other methods exist for trajectory analysis. And I guess that um, there, there are, are numerous, quite a few yes. problems, quite a few methods that exist on trajectory analysis. But I will say they are often doing something different. It's a highly overloaded term. Usually what trajectory analysis methods are doing is assuming that the whole data is one more or less connected manifold and they're drawing trajectories through that manifold. Sort of, for example, the first trajectory analysis method that I can think of was maybe diffusion pseudo time, which is, which is a fantastic method, but it was basically drawing paths through the connected manifold. Trajectory net is really meant for highly spaced out measurements. So it's not a problem that most of them were addressing to begin with. And I see a question um, from Vijay, I think, um, in the chat. So regarding the last part of the talk, using temporal development of cells at the single cell level, can you also assess changes in receptor ligand interactions temporarily over time? Yeah, we can. Actually, uh, we have single cell RNA sequencing and ATEX sequencing in cells. Actually, um, if you had them simultaneously, that would have been ideal, but the current experiment we're looking at has them measured separately. But still, because we can draw those trajectories temporally through the same period of time, uh, we can see uh, chromatin opening and closing in different regions, um, not necessarily pertaining to the same gene, for example, enhancer regions um, precede the expression of the gene. Okay, and then um, maybe one final question. So can trajectory net be on single cell data that don't have more than three intermediate states like stem cells? Not mm -hmm. sure I quite understand. Maybe the person can clarify. If you can write me a clarification, I'll answer it. I don't, I don't yeah, know. maybe you can answer in the chat afterwards. I think it might be easier than um, doing this one. Perfect. So, okay, I'm receiving a message from Martin that says we will now have a, an approximately 10 minute break. So um, we'll come back here at a little bit after quarter past the hour. And the next speaker will be Mermit Singer. And um, I'd like just to thank again, Peter and Sita for two contrasting, but really fantastic talks. Really enjoyed that session. And I'll see everybody in about 10 minutes time. Okay, thanks.